good afternoon. Welcome you all to our uh, today conference, today colloquium. I am really uh, very pleased and I'm happy to introduce you uh, the speaker today, uh, Corina Uchigai. Let me say just a few words about uh, her biography. So she uh, received her diploma in uh, mathematics, mathematics from Spoiler uh, Mare Superiore di Pisa in 2002. And uh, after that, uh, she received her PhD in mathematics at the Princeton University in 2007, and uh, under the supervision of the Sinai. Uh, following uh, her degree, uh, she spent uh, one semester at the MSRI in uh, university, at the Institute in Berkeley, and uh, following that at the Institute in Princeton. And uh, uh, she's now a professor in pure and uh, mathematics at the University of Bristol since 2015. Uh, previously, she was a lecturer and reader at the same university. She, Corina, is uh, quite well known for the major contribution in ergodic theory, dynamic, dynamical system, and technical uh, dynamics, uh, in particular, uh, studying uh, chaotic properties uh, of uh, parabolic dynamical systems. She's uh, mainly known for her uh, contribution in uh, first in our PhD thesis uh, in solving an uh, important long-standing problem uh, concerning uh, ergodic properties of locally Hamiltonian flows on surfaces. <coughs> and uh, let me also mention her result with uh, Prasek uh, on uh, mm, that is quite surprising for the expert in the field uh, that uh, for a broad class of uh, billiard dynamics showed that the system is not ergodic in most direction. Uh, she is, uh, uh, was awarded uh, the European Mathematical Society Prize in 2012, the Wired Prize in 2013, and uh, the Lever Kuhn Prize in 2014, and she was also a recipient of the ERC grant in 2013. I'm really happy to introduce you, Corinna uh, Chirai, who is going to speak about billiards, surfaces, and jobs. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction and thanks a lot mainly for the invitation. I don't know if you I'm Italian, I'm from Trieste originally, so I'm really happy to be back in Italy. I've never been to the University of Padua before, so I'm really happy to be here today. And thanks to Fabio Cora and everybody for the invitation. So, the topic of my talk, we will uh, meet billiards and surfaces in a little bit. I want to start uh, telling you about chaos and the type of chaos that I study. And I hope to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, the area in which I've been working. And best of By the end, I hope you will know what type Muller dynamics is. scary name maybe means. And uh, that is not scary at all. And hopefully I will also mention actually both the results that uh, Fabio mentioned in his introduction. So you will know exactly the, the results that I pulled and the things I do. Okay, so let me start with something um, I think almost everybody should have heard. So, as I said, I'm interested in chaotic systems, and there are many ways to define chaos mathematically. There are many definitions of what people mean by chaos. But there is at least one feature that every definition of chaos includes. And this is the what is called in popular, in popular mathematics, it's called the butterfly effect. So you might have heard that uh, Lawrence, Edward Lawrence, who was a meteorologist and also a mathematician, um, he described his butterfly effect saying a butterfly flapping wings in Brazil can cause a tornado in Texas. So, what does it mean? A system which is chaotic, the more mathematically we say, displays sensitive dependence on initial condition. And this is what this butterfly effect means. If you change a little bit the initial state of your system, for example, by changing a butterfly in the weather evolution, if butterfly flapping the wind creates a slightly different initial condition. If your system displays sensitive dependence on initial condition or the butterfly effect, this little initial difference will evolve in time to create possibly a macroscopically very different time evolution. So this little difference of a butterfly can cause a tornado. Okay? 
So this image um, describes this idea of sensitive dependence, which is a crucial property of chaotic systems. A small variation in initial condition can create very different time evolution. OK, so I want to tell you that the type of chaos I'm interested in is something that I like to call slow chaos. What does this mean? So you can ask how quickly this divergence, if I change initial condition, how quickly the future uh, diverge or change. And I want to roughly distinguish between chaotic systems, fast chaos, and slow chaos. So fast means that this divergence is quick, and slowly it's slow. What does quick and slow? Quickly means, for me, exponentially fast in time. So the divergence, as I change initial condition, the evolution diverge exponentially. And slowly, instead, means anything lower than exponential. For example, polynomial or sub-polynomial, sub-exponential. And, uh, okay, in dynamical system, more precisely, fast chaos is called, those are called hyperbolic dynamical system, those are called parabolic. But I don't want to use these terms because many people I know work in PDE, maybe they do hyperbolic or parabolic. This is not the same, it does not have to do with parabolic or hyperbolic PDE. So let me drop hyperbolic and parabolic and just talk today of fast chaos versus slow chaos. And if you want a little bit more mathematics, if anybody has heard of entropy, these systems which are fast chaotic have positive entropy and feature called exponential decay of correlation. Don't worry if you've never heard these words. Just if you've heard them, I'm going to mention them. And another feature of slow chaos is that it corresponds to entropy zero. So it's chaotic, but some people have a, that depends on how you define chaos. Okay, forget about this. What I want to say is that fast chaotic systems are very well understood. And there's a rich theory that goes back to the 1970s. And Sinai and Ozov and many others started this theory. On the other hand, slow chaotic systems, there's no, there is no general theory. So very few examples are very well understood. But there is no general framework to understand this type of system. So my research is mainly about mathematical features of slow chaos. And it's in dynamical systems and their ergodic theory. And I, I use tools from analysis, tools from geometry. And there are connections with mathematical physics. Some of the problems come from mathematical physics. And some of them also have connection with probability and number theory. So I hope to give you a little bit of an overview. So this was a general introduction about slow chaos. Now I want to talk about billiards and surfaces. And we will see that billiards and surfaces will give us examples of slow chaos. Okay, so what is a mathematical billiard? So I think many people might have played billiard in a pub. A pub. I mean, I mean, you can hear the other pubs, but you might have played billiard somewhere uh, in your life. So in a billiard, this is a mathematical idealization of the billiard game. So you have a table. The standard table is a rectangle. In general, I will look at uh, subsets of the plane, domains in the plane. The ball is a particle with no mass, so it's a point, and there is no friction on my table. So the ball, if I shoot my ball in some direction, it will move as a billiard ball on a table. So it travels on a straight line, and it bounces at the billiard table, making the same angle of incidence and same, it's the same of the angle of reflection. Okay? It's an elastic reflection at the boundary of the table. You see, that's a billiard ball trajectory. And as I said, instead than in the real billiard tables, I don't want friction, so my trajectory will keep moving with the same speed. And main difference, I don't want to shoot my ball to the pocket. So I, don't, I want to ignore, ignore balls which end up in a corner. I'm just going to look at billiard balls which keep traveling forever on my table with no friction and no heating of the corners. Okay? And playing billiard in a rectangle mathematically is very boring and I will tell you later why. So I want to change billiard table shape. So you can make it much more interesting by adding a barrier. 
You can also add an obstacle, and we'll meet this table later on. And you can just play in any polygon, in any polygonal uh, shape, or you can make also concave pieces of boundary. Okay? And we are playing now, these are all examples of compact tables. We will play in a second on infinite planar tables also. So what is the motivation to play billiard? Not to become good billiard players, because we don't want to send balls in the pocket. So billiards arise as models of many systems in physics, so in mechanics, but clearly in opt optics and acoustics, because the rays of light and sound, you can think they travel with this billiard motion. But also in thermodynamics and mechanics, there are systems that are not obviously billiard, but you can reduce the phase space to a billiard. And there are also a simple and interesting, not so simple to understand, but simple to describe model of chaotic systems. Right? <coughs> Mathematical billiards. So I want to tell you that the shape of uh, the boundary of your, the, the, actually the features of the boundary influence a lot the type of properties that your system has. So roughly you can have, you can roughly divide billiards in three types, if the boundary is convex, concave, or made by straight lines. So if you have a convex boundary, like a circle or an ellipse, you enter the domain of integrable billiards and Hamiltonian dynamics. And I know there are some people here that look at integrable systems. So this is an example of an integrable system. And you can study it with variational methods, and it has very different features that are very different from what I want to talk today. At the opposite end, uh, I said I want to use hyperbolic, but this I want to use fast chaos. These billiards where the domain is concave are very chaotic, are an example of fast chaos. And in between, I will tell you in a second, I'll give you an idea why. In between this convex and concave, you have the straight line boundary, the polygonal billiards. And if you, I will tell you later, if you look at uh, um, certain class of polygonal billiards, you see what I call slow chaos. So let me give you another example. You can also take a square table and add an obstacle. So if the obstacle is, a, say, another rectangle, you get into this slow chaos world. If your obstacle is a circle, this looks uh, concave from the, from the billiard table. So it's convex, but from the outside it looks concave. So this is an example of fast chaos and hyperbolic. And uh, let me tell you why it's so different. These two words are very different. So if you have these concave pieces, concave from outside, then the phenomenon that you can see is so-called scattering. So if you shoot parallel rays, billion balls in parallel directions, with slightly different position, you see that after uh, reflecting for the first time against the scatterer, they uh, are scattered, they defocus. This is called defocusing mechanism. So we talked about the butterfly effect. Even if you shoot in the same direction, but just change a little bit your initial position, you see that already after one iteration, the future diverge. And it diverge actually quite quickly. So this creates the butterfly effect. If you change a little bit, the future might be significantly different and hard to predict. It's just a heuristic, but that's, and it's, it's a true mechanism which is called defocusing or scattering and Sinai. Uh, so this billiard is called <coughs> Sinai billiard, the rectangle with the circle scatterer. And uh, uh, Jakob Sinai, who was indeed my advisor in Princeton for my PhD, he, he won the Abel Prize in 2014. And one of the results that was mentioned in the Abel Prize citation is uh, exactly that he proved that uh, the Sinai billiard is fast chaotic, okay? On the other hand, if I shoot my parallel rays on a rectangular scatterer, you see that after the first reflection, they keep staying close to each other, okay? So if they hit a straight segment, there is no defocusing. But if some rays hit uh, near a corner, some rays are reflected and some keep going. So only the corners create some divergence okay, in the future evolution. And this is morally the idea why the system, 
also has a butterfly effect phenomenon, but the butterfly effect happens much slower than in this fast chaotic billiard. And this uh, uh, billiards in polygons, where the angles of the polygons are rational multiples of pi, so they are what rational means rational, no, rational bigger. Rational means that the angles are of the form pi times p over q angles. <coughs> so all angles are rational multiples of pi. If you look at the oh, sorry, billiards of this form, uh, these are studied by an area called tech Muller dynamics that I will try to give you some idea of. And it has been a very, very fruitful area of research in the past 30 years. And many fields medalists actually proved the results about billiards in polygons, like uh, Arthur Avila and Maria Mirzakani, who received the Fields Medal in the last round. But previously, also Maxim Konsievich, Kurt McMullen, Jean Christophe Yokos, they all worked, well, that's not why they received the Fields Medal, but later on they all worked in this area of the Muller dynamics and uh, rational billiards. Okay, so this is the area which I will focus today. Okay? Um, some real life examples of tables. These are some polygonal tables in real life if you want to play on an L shape. This is a joke, of course, I said already. We don't care about billiards because of this, but it was just a fun picture. Let me give you two real examples of real, two examples of billiards which appear in mathematical physics, not quite famous models. These are infinite planar billiards, infinite planar periodic billiards. And one is known as Lorentz gas, and it's a model, this is a okay, fast periodic billiard. So this is uh, a model uh, suggested by Lorentz. It's not the same Lorentz as before. Uh, it's a physicist, this one from 1905. And it's motivated, um, so what is the billiard? You place on the plane periodically some circular scatterers. So you look at Z2, the integers, and you place at each point with integer coordinates a circular scatterer. And then you play billiard outside of the scatterers. Okay? It's like a ping pong, a flipper in Italian, like a flipper game. These are some different billiard balls. Ah, sorry. And it was actually because it's also called the Drude model, because you could imagine it was introduced to study um, statistical mechanics, thermodynamics. You could think that these uh, scatterers are like atoms in a uh, regular spacing. You could think of atoms in a metal or in a crystal, and the electrons are the billiard balls moving around. So you can think like if it's a model of atoms in a metal with electron motion inside. <coughs> A uh, slightly slight variation on this was suggested by uh, Paul and Tatiana Ehrenfest in 1912. Actually, the periodic version is due to Hardy and Decker a few years later. So they suggested, instead of circles, to put rectangular scatterers. Okay. So this billiard is known as Ehrenfest model or Ehrenfest win tree. And here again, it's the same idea. In the periodic version, you put scatterers at every point with integer coordinates, and just the scatterers are rectangular. And for the same reason I told you before, uh, uh, for the same heuristic, this billiard is actually fast chaotic. And indeed, it was actually studied uh, since the, there are lots of mathematical results. And there's a rich theory. Results were proven by Galavotti, Spon, Bodrigini, then Bulyovic and Sinai, then Sass has many results, and also Michael Lee, uh, Jens Markloff in, in Bristol has made some, lots of breakthroughs on this, and with Strombergson. So there is a lot of mathematical uh, uh, knowledge about uh, the Erfes, the, the, sorry, the Lorentz class. On the other hand, it's kind of funny that Paul and Tatiana Erfes thought that rectangular scatterers should be easier to understand than circular scatterers. But in reality, only in the few uh, past five years, we've started having results on this periodic Erfes model. So it took much longer. There were lots of numerical simulations, but very few rigorous, rigorous results. And the recent results are all took so long because it deeply uses the cooler dynamics that we'll tell you about later. Okay? This is again uh, convex versus flat and fast versus slow. 
uh, butterfly effect. Okay, so I want to tell you some of the results on the LFS model. So I need two mathematical definitions. So if you have a system which is chaotic, two features you might want to investigate are uh, the presence of dense trajectories and ergodicity. So let me define this. So the idea is that if you have a system that is chaotic, a trifical trajectory will explore all space. Okay? In which sense can you ask that? You can ask this from a topological point of view. So you can ask whether there exist dense trajectories. If you have a system with a dense trajectory, you call it transitive. Or maybe even stronger if all trajectories are dense. So you call uh, this minimality. Uh, let me give you an example in the uh, rectangle. This is an example of a periodic trajectory. This is a trajectory which closes up after four bounces. And this is a plot of a trajectory in a pentagon which looks it is like it's getting dense. Right? If you keep going, you will actually see completely gray, uh, gray picture. OK. On the, you can also ask a measured theoretical notion. Uh, so this is ergodicity. So a system is ergodic, a billiard is ergodic if there are no trivial invariant sets. So what does this mean? I don't want to be very precise today, but so to define this, you need a measure which is invariant under your flow. Uh, in my case, it will be mostly like the area we will see later. We will see later. Okay, if you, you need an invariant measure. And invariant set means a set which is mapped into itself by, by your evolution. So if you have a set which is mapped into itself, it has to be trivial from the point of view of the measure. So it either has to have measure zero or the complement has to have measure zero. Okay, if you don't want to remember this definition, let me tell you an important consequence. The notion of ergodicity was devised but after Boltzmann has suggested more than a century ago the notion of the Boltzmann ergodic hypothesis. So he thought whether, he asked whether, um, okay. Uh, okay, let me say, the Boltzmann ergodic hypothesis, which is true under the assumption of ergodicity, says that basically almost every trajectory in your billiard will be dense and moreover uniformly distributed. So it will spend uh, in every part of space an amount of time which is proportional to the measure of that part of space. So this is what is stated by the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, which is one of the main results in ergodic theorem, theory. But you need ergodicity for this uniform distribution to be true. Uh, so let me give you another picture. This is a trajectory in the, um, in the barrier, in the square with the barrier. You see, this trajectory looks like it's getting dense, so it looks like it's going everywhere. But you see, visibly, that there are areas where it spends more time than others. So this is an example of a trajectory which is dense, but not uniformly distributed with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So it doesn't spend in each area a, part, a, a time proportional to the area of that part. Okay? So, okay. So ergodicity is very important to do a you want to know that your billiard is ergodic, and many billiards are known to be ergodic. For example, all hyperbolic billiards, uh, are all cha fast chaotic billiards, are in particular ergodic, both in the bounded setup. For example, this Sinai billiard that I showed you before is ergodic. And this comes from Sinai proof in particular. And it's also true for unbounded. Uh, Complex scatterers. For example, for the periodic Lorentz uh, gas, we know that it's ergodic. What about billiards in polygons? If you take a polygon with rational, with angles which are rational multiples of pi, then there is a famous result due to Kerkhoff, Mason, and Smiley in the 80s. And this is one of the pillars, one of the seminal results which uses the polar dynamics. And they prove that in any rational uh, billiard, for almost every direction, so if I shoot at random, I will see um, trajectories which are dense and uniformly distributed. So the billiard in almost every direction is ergodic. And in this case, the invariant measure I'm using is actually area. So the, the time that you spend in some part of your table is proportional to the area of that region. Okay. okay. <clears throat> 
So what about uh, the Everfest model? So there were some results uh, in the last years of uh, looking for uh, ergodic examples of infinite periodic polygonal billiards. So maybe you might hope to, to, to think that maybe also the Everfest model will be ergodic for almost every direction. Um, so let me show you, this is a simulation that a colleague of mine, Carl Dachmann in Bristol made of the LFS model. You don't see the scatterers here, but you see the scatterers are the white rectangles. This is a trajectory which looks like it's becoming dense and equidistributed in the complement of the rectangles. This is another example of a trajectory which looks fractal, but very far from being dense. So, what I proved together with Shisto Franček, who is a Polish author of mine, and disappeared in Invenciones in 2014, is that um, for every rectangular obstacle, uh, for, for every, well, independently on the length of the height and the width of your rectangle, in almost every direction, the billiard in the RFS model doesn't have dense trajectories, so it's not transitive, doesn't have dense trajectory topologically, and it's not ergodic. So it was maybe disappointing for people who were hoping to prove ergodicity. We showed that it's not uh, ergodic, and actually it's not ergodic in a very drastic way. So there is something called the ergodic decomposition, where you can decompose into ergodic components, and this ergodic decomposition has uncountably many ergodic components, so it's very far from being ergodic. Whatever this means, it doesn't matter. And in the same, this paper actually that we wrote together, uh, it's not only about the Aerofest, even though the Aerofest was our main application, we proved uh, that under certain conditions, uh, there's a kind of a criterion which shows you that certain periodic polygonal billiards fail to be ergodic in almost every direction. Another example which fits our criteria is uh, what is called retroreflector. This is an infinite cube with periodically spaced barriers. This is the same result, for example, covers also. This is not ergodic for almost every direction in such a drastic way. And let me tell you, there has been lots of recent breakthroughs on the RFS model. Apart from this ergodicity, there, it was proven by Arthur Avila and Pascal Hubert uh, that in almost every direction, trajectories are recurrent, which means that if you shoot a trajectory, it will come back infinitely many times, arbitrarily close to where you started. So even though you're not dead, you're recurrent. And also, if you are like uh, physicists or maybe probabilists also, might be curious about a uh, typical question you would like to ask is how fast do you explore your table? So if I start from the center and I shoot my trajectory, in time t, how far do I get? So you will know that if you look at a random walk, the diffusion rate is t to the one half. So in time t, you will go t to the one half far. It turns out that you, uh, trajectories, the diffusion uh, is of order t to the two third. So it's faster than a random walk in exploring space. This is what sometimes physicists call super diffusion. And this is a recent uh, result by De La Croix, Cuber, and Lievre. And this two-third is really like a success of the Muller dynamics, because I will try to tell you at the end, this two-third is a Lyapunov exponent and the Muller flow. So it has a very deep mathematics behind it. And guessing this thing numerically is not so obvious. And believing that it's two-third and not, uh, I don't know, 0 0.6 something, it's really, I will try to think a little bit of something behind this whole theory. Okay. So why now? Because of the Muller dynamics, so this is more motivating what will come next. Before we start with this, one more result about non-ergodicity. You can also, I also studied, for example, uh, recently, uh, what are called Eton lenses. These are not billiard, but they are related to billiards. So this is a lens, this yellow is a circular lens called Eton lens, which acts as a perfect retroreflector. So if you shoot, a particle in a certain direction, inside the lens it's deflected so that it comes out traveling in the opposite direction. So it enters in direction theta, it goes out on the opposite side in direction minus theta. 
occurrence in the sun, um, you can look at periodic configuration of eaton lenses. So place these eaton lenses periodically in the plane and look at the motion of light rays. So you shoot a light. Here it's not pictured inside the lens, but you the red is a light ray trajectory. So you enter, you are deflected, you enter, you are deflected, and so on. So you travel in direction theta or minus theta. Um, so this is not a strict billiard in the sense I gave you, gave you before, but it's an example of a soft billiard where particles are not reflected but deflected inside. But you can realize it with a Coulomb potential inside uh, the lens. And I want to say that this Eton lenses, arrays, are also not ergodic, but for a very different reason that you can actually see. Very different than elephants. Well, there's, OK, so let me tell you a direction is trapped if every light ray in that direction stays in a band. That's an example of a trap trajectory. You see, this trajectory travels back and forth within a band, okay? a strip in the plane. So what I also proved with Franchek and Ron Van uh, this is still a preprint, uh, we proved that for every configuration of Eton lenses, almost every direction is trapped. So here you see that you cannot have dense trajectories, and you see why. Trajectories stay in a band. So they are confined. In the LFS model, there, is, there are no bands. And so you look like your trajectory is going everywhere, but you can prove that it's not dense. But this is, it's also, it turns out to be a, uh, related to the Muller dynamics in a way that maybe we have to. And I should say, Franchek and Small first proved this for random periodic configurations. And a student, a PhD student of mine, who is now at Centro de Giorgio in Pisa, Mauro Artigiani, he constructed exceptional directions for which actually you can be still ergodic and dense in the plane. So even though most trajectories are trapped, there exists a set of measure zero but positive house to dimension of directions for which you actually are dense and ergodic. Okay? Okay. So time to start to go to surfaces and to tell you the very basic, very basic idea behind the Muller dynamics. We want to reduce billiards in polygons to flows of surfaces. So now it's a, it's a very nice mathematical idea, very simple, that it's quite old, but I want everybody to listen carefully. OK, so let's do the rectangle, and let's figure out why the rectangle is easy to understand. This idea is called unfolding, or katok zemliakov construction, even though I was, people thought it before katok zemliakov it was already studied. So I don't want uh, to study the trajectory in the square. Instead of uh, looking at uh, reflections of the trajectory, I want to reflect the table and travel straight, as we tell you. So you see, here my trajectory is deflected, right? Instead, I want to look at the straight trajectory in a reflected copy of the table, OK? I can keep doing this unfolding of the trajectory, so I keep going in a straight line, and every time I hit and my original trajectory was bouncing, I reflect my table along. Okay? So clearly, if I have a square, I could just unfold it to a straight line in a square grid. But that works only for the square, so I don't want to just, I can only do it for polygons which pave the plane. I want to do something a little bit different. I want to notice that I can only take four copies because the reflections of the square are the tahedral group of order four. So I just need four copies to catch all possible orientations. So I want to take these four copies and I want to choose to move this copy over there. So I take these four copies and if my trajectory hits, for example, this side, I should reflect the table but I already have a table with this orientation. You see, the colors here are important on the sides. There are four possible color orientations. So this copy is already there. So from here, I keep going straight in that copy. Okay? So what do I do? Every time I leave one side of my big square, 4 by 4, I continue in the opposite point on the other side. Okay? So and I go straight. So I want to basically glue uh, vertical sides by parallel translations. What do I get? I think you all know that I get a torus, a surface of genus 1. And 
the billiard trajectory became what I call a straight line trajectory on the torus. And on the torus, <coughs> it looks like this. It's the trajectory of what I call the linear flow on the torus. Okay? So I'm moving on a straight line that wraps around your torus. Okay? What did I gain? Well, I claim that now you can easily show that there are only two types of behaviors. So if your slope was rational, you will have a closed billiard trajectory. If your slope is irrational, you can do as an exercise, you can prove that your trajectory will be dense. So, to completely understand the billiard in a rectangle or in a square. Okay, boring. Time to do more fun and to do higher genus. So, if I start from any polygon with rational angles, and now I drew, because I like to draw LFS, I, like, I drew an example of a square with a rectangular obstacle. But you can do a regular pentagon, you can do whichever polygon you want with angles which are rational multiples of pi. The key thing that you want that the order of the reflection group, the group generated by reflections at sides, is finite. If the reflection group has finite order, I can uh, unfold by taking, I can take finitely many copies of my uh, polygon, the polygonal table. In this case, I also only need four copies. If I had done another, uh, I wish I had done, I had a picture with it. Um, a triangle which unfolds to a regular octagon, and it doesn't matter. You take as many copies as you need, but you want to take all possible orientations of your table after reflection, and you can unfold the trajectory. Now it's less obvious to understand. You can figure out, for example, when you hit, um, uh, what do we do? Uh, okay, if I hit, okay, you have to figure out if I reflect my table inside of my trajectory, where will I continue? You can do this little exercise and you figure out that in this case, for example, this red side is glued to red. Everything which is parallel and opposite of the same color, so this green with this green, the blue, it has to be identified. So I'm gluing this four squares with four rectangular holes together, and if I do the identifications that I need to do, that I show here, you can compute the Euler characteristic of this surface that I get, and I claim it's a surface of genus 5. Okay? So for any rational polygon, you will get a surface of a certain genus. Okay? Typically, you will get genus greater than 2, so sometimes you get the torus, many times you get higher, surface, higher genus surfaces. And you get more than only a topological surface. You get what is called a flat surface. So you get a surface which is glued out of polygons in the plane with identifications given by parallel translations. So your surface inherits what is called a flat Euclidean structure. So it has a flat metric, a metric like the plane. Okay? And it has a notion of direction which is well defined apart finitely many points. So you, if someone remembers you studied Klaus Bonnet, or I don't know if you study Greenwald, some kind of basic. <coughs> so you should, should, someone should complain and tell me, how can you have a surface of genus 2 with a metric which is flat? Because Gauss Bonnet should tell you that uh, the integral of the curvature is the Euler characteristic of your surface. So, you know, you remember this thing. I don't know what I should assume from student in Italy anymore. Okay, in any case, Mm, the, the trick is that this flat metric uh, is not completely flat. It has conical singularities. It has some special points which come from the vertices, where actually which don't have a Euclidean neighborhood, but have what is called a conical neighborhood. They look, you know, a cone or ice cream cone is a conical singularity, but this is an outside. It's an ice cream cone where you have more than two pi going around. You have a multiple of two pi. So this is where all the negative curvature that should exist in genus greater than 2, the, all, all the negative cur curvature is hidden in these finitely many cone points. Okay. So that, I don't want to stress this, but uh, these are these uh, finitely many mm. conical singularities. And the billiard trajectory unfolds to a linear trajectory on the surface. And this is kind of a geodesic for the flat metric. Okay? I said I want to avoid trajectories which hit the corners. So a trajectory which doesn't hit the corner will look like a straight line, always defined geodesic on the surface. If you look at trajectories that hit the corners, 
there are actually many that you don't know how to continue because what it looks like you have a cell on your surface flow. Okay? So conical singularities correspond to settle of your linear flow. So this is the flow with some settles and some separatives. Okay, forget about this. The important thing is that we reduce the billiard to a flow on a surface. So a flow, I don't know if there are any, anybody in computer science or anybody who does a flow is just a, uh, something that associates to a point. Uh, the flow the flowing for time t gives you the position of the point after time t. And how can you get flows? We got a flow on the surface by unfolding media trajectories. These are also geodesics for the flat metric with conical singularity. I also want to now enlarge a little bit the focus. I don't want only to look at this. Um, flows from billiards, you can more generally look at uh, smooth area preserving flows on the surface. So these are flows which are smooth and preserve some smooth area flow, area, area form. And uh, you can think of them as giving yourself, I don't know if anybody, you give yourself an area form, so a uh, non degenerate two form, and a closed one form. And then you can contract the one form and get a vector field which preserves the area form. And these flows are also called the locally Hamiltonian or multivariate Hamiltonian flows. I know somebody in the audience is interested in Hamiltonian systems. So. And okay, so why should we care about area preserving flows on surfaces? Well, they are a fundamental example of a low dimensional dynamical system and they are a great model for slow chaos. And let me also tell you that um, in the 90s, Novikov uh, found a model uh, in solid state physics. It's a mo model of uh, electrons in metals under a magnetic field. <coughs> and electrons move on what are called Fermi surfaces, energy level Fermi surfaces in the semi classical limit of the magnetic field. Um, and this uh, Novikov flows also give rise to smooth area preserving flows. So, I want to mention this other result that was also mentioned in the introduction. So, another part of my research, in the, the research theme that I carried through uh, since I was a PhD student, was indeed the study of chaotic properties of these uh, smooth area preserving flows, also called Novikov flows and also called locally Hamiltonian flows. So, these are flows on surfaces which are smooth and preserve a smooth area form. And we talked about ergodicity, but a, a, a stronger chaotic property you might want to know is mixing. So when is a flow mixing? Let me show you a simulation. So if you take instead of one particle, you take a cloud of initial particles. If your flow is mixing, it means that as you are, this is an example, sorry, it's a billiard in a, in a it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a diamond, so it's not flat, but it's like a curve. You see what happens? If you flow it, your initial cloud of particles spreads around. And this A was my original set, initial set, that I can think of as a cloud of partial, it's any measurable set. If I flow it for time t, it will spread uniformly. This if, but if the, the, the flow is mixing with any measurable set, when I flow it, spreads. And let me show you again. You see, okay, this is how it looks. And the definition of mixing that I gave here, so if an area preserving flow is mixing, if for any two measurable sets, if I flow A and I look at the proportion of A inside B after a long time, this converges to the area of B. Okay, so the ratio between the part of A in B and A is the area of B. Okay, so I wanted to mention this other result, but then I can see. Um, so when did we start to finish at uh, 5, right? Okay. 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 okay, so I'll have another. Okay, let me just tell you this other result about mixing of these flows. Th there was a question raised by Arnold in the 90s about motivated by these novel flows. And uh, the question, oh, sorry. Yeah, the other question is, if I take one of these uh, smooth area preserving flows motivated by solid state physics, are they mixing? So do they have this property of initial clouds or trajectories spreading? And the answer in genus one, so the genus matters a lot. If the surface is genus one, the answer is yes, they are mixing. And this was proven by Sinai and Hanin 
a few years later, just two years after Arnold asked this question. But for higher genus, the question was open for much longer. And this is where my work comes um, into play. So for higher genus, the answer is that it depends. They can or they cannot be mixing. And it depends on the type of singularities. So if there are what I like to call traps, so if you have a saddle and the center, you see here you have a center, and here you have the trajectories which are closed and are trapped in a saddle loop. This is a half of a figure eight. This is a trap. If you have traps on your surface floor, like here, then it turns out, so okay, so if you don't have traps, if there are no saddle loops, then typically there is a notion of measure of this space of the smooth area preserving flows. Tip in for almost every such flow, you're not mixing. And this is the result that uh, was published in Annas of Mathematics, and it's one of the results which was mentioned in some of these prices that uh, I received. And on the other hand, if there are traps, and this is a result which starts from my PhD thesis, so if, my, if there are traps, you can prove that outside of the traps, uh, sorry, outside of the traps, you actually are mixing. So this is, as I said, started with my PhD, but uh, for example, recently with some co-authors, we proved that not to, uh, a bit later I proved that even though you're not mixing, you can prove something that is called weak mixing, it's a little bit less than mixing. And uh, even in the mixing case, you can refine your result proving that you are mixing of all orders, which is much more than mixing. And this is a recent preprint. And uh, I have a PhD, a recent a PhD student, Davide Rabotti, who is also in Italia and also in Bristol, he proved that you can quantify the speed of mixing, and as you expect from a slow chaotic system, you mix very slowly. So you mix actually at sub-polynomial, at logarithmic speed. So they are very slowly mixing. And it's nice because you don't have so many natural systems which are mixing, weakly mixing but not mixing, and you don't have so many examples of slowly mixing systems. So it started from a PhD, but there are many recent results still being proved. Okay, let me skip this because I, I had some pictures about how mixing happens. About It's a f feature called shearing, but I will skip this. Uh, and I want to say there's a way in which slowly chaotic systems are mixing, which uh, is very typical of slow chaos. And if you want, I can tell you more later. Uh, and you can put much deeper properties, like study the spectrum of some slowly chaotic system using this uh, shearing or mixing mechanism. I want to move to uh, the basic idea of technical dynamics for the, rest, uh, for the last 10 minutes. So, and I think it's a very nice idea, so I want to tell you, even though it will be just heuristically, how do we prove both the results about Errorfest and the results about mixing or non mixing for this area preserving flow? The techniques are based on Tegmuller dynamics. So let me tell you what Tegmuller, what randomization is about first. So renormalization is another terrible name because like chaos has many definitions. Renormalization means different things to different people. So the people that call about renormalization theory in mathematical physics is not what I'm going to tell you about. It's renormalization in dynamical systems. And maybe it's an idea that I learned from Sinai, maybe, but it's very common in dynamical system. So so you want to study one system, for example, one flow on a surface. Instead, you build the space of both systems of the same time, and here I am deliberately vague, I will tell you later what it is exactly, and your system becomes a point in that space of systems. And then, that's my animation, I became a point in my space of systems, and then I start flowing the system, so I start deforming my original system. And in this context, this will happen, I will tell you in a second. So you have a system, and you think it as a point in the space of the systems, and you deform your system. And the deformation is a flow on the space of systems. And why do you do this? You choose a flow which acts as a zoom machine, as a zooming machine, which kind of in, uh, zooms in different time scales of your system. And this is what renormalization does for you. Renormalization is a zooming machine which deforms your system to blow up some scales. And why does it help? So I will tell you the next time what type of dynamics does for you. The key thing is that renormalization, good renormalizations, are fast chaotic systems. 
And fast chaotic systems are much better understood than slow chaotic systems because they have a richer theory. So sometimes you can understand the properties of the renormalization and gain some understanding of the properties of the system you're zooming in. So let me be, if you want to be, if you care, I can just in a sec. So here the space is the modular space of flat surfaces. So those are all compact flat surfaces with a certain genus. Or if you like complex, there's a complex and a, a meeting presentation, there are Riemann surfaces with an abelian different, with a holomorphic one form. A point in this space is a flat surface with a given direction. And you can think of it as a polygon with sides which are parallel glued by translations. Like we saw the square torus or the other example. And what is the deformation flow that you use? You use the type Muller geodesic flow. It's a fancy name, but it's very simple what it does. It stretches, it's a, just the application of the linear diagonal matrices which stretches horizontals and squeezes vertical. So it deforms your polygon by stretching and squeezing. But there is an equivalence relation between polygons that if I can cut and paste a polygon in a different way, this is the same surface. So you should think of this deformation on the polygons up to cut and paste. Otherwise, it's stupid. I just deform my polygon. So I'm cut, deforming and cutting and pasting. And this acts as renormalization because if I have a very long trajectory in a certain direction, vertical direction, when I stretch and squeeze, my trajectory shrinks. So I change my geometric structure, I change my polygon, but I get a shorter trajectory on a different flat surface. So the idea is that I simplify my trajectory because from long it becomes short, but the price I have to pay that I have to modify the flat metric. So that's the basic idea. Why does it help? Well, I claim that the basic philosophy is that to study a given flow on a given flat surface, you want to shoot this deformation, this type Muller geodesic, take your flat surface, deform it by the geodesic flow, and look at the properties of your geodesic. I, I mentioned this key result about ergodicity in billions, can convince us why. It's based on this criterion by Mesur, which is the starting point of the Muller dynamics, for example. If you want to prove that the flow on a certain polygon on a certain flat surface is a volume, <coughs> it's enough to show that the Tegmuller geodesic is recurrent. So recurrence in this deformation space implies ergodicity. And it's a beautiful criteria that I like a lot. And my work on mixing, answering this question of Arnold, exploits this Tegmuller geodesic renormalization. So the mixing properties of an area preserving flows depend heavily on having quantitative estimates on this recurrence. So you want to your technology desk to recur with certain rates. And from this you can infer things. And I want to finish going back to polygons. So, so in the first model, uh, okay, so I spoke about, uh, sorry, we did unfolding for, we did unfolding for this type of billiard. So let me recall you, the LFS model is a Z2 periodic cover of this billiard, right? It's a Z2 uh, repetition of this. So you can believe me if I tell you, if I unfold this compact billiard, I get a surface of genus 5. If I unfold the LFS model, I get also a surface, but it's going to be an infinite periodic surface, which is a periodic cover of this compact one. So it's a cover whose deck group is in Z2. Okay? So what you are studying in this infinite polygonal billiards periodic are periodic covers of flat surfaces. And here, okay, this is a periodic cover. And the same you can do for Eton. Okay, let me skip this. So you can replace <coughs> your Eton lens. There is a way to reduce the study of Eton of uh, arrays of Eton lenses to a flow on an infinite periodic flat surface. And uh, uh, renormalization for infinite periodic surfaces is based on, on uh, uh, also on uh, the Tegmuller geodesic flow. So you still want to apply this Tegmuller deformation to your compact surface. Uh, and this is what maybe will be vague if anybody can explain later. If you want to, what you want to understand is how do I move in this Z2 cover? So how, as I move in my base surface, how do I displace myself in the Z2 cover? And then you have to study what are called the Lyapunov exponents of the Tegmuller flow. 
and you have to understand how this deformation acts on the homology of your surface. And this is a whole technical. So there is this word uh, where the Konsevich Zorich cycle appears. And for example, these two thirds, I mentioned that in the RFS model, the rate of diffusion is two thirds. These two thirds is indeed a uh, diagonal exponent of this deformed flow. And I mentioned also in Eton lenses, you have some, uh, um, sorry, two thirds is the diffusion exponent. And the fact that the second exponent is positive, this exponent is positive, it's key in proving non ergodicity And in Eton lenses, again, it's this diaphragm of exponents that play a role. And uh, uh, these strict directions are eigen directions of the certain some negative diaphragm exponents. Okay, so this is a little bit too vague. And, uh, Okay, let me skip. Uh, I will finish. Just uh, let me skip this. I uh, don't want to take too much of the time. Let me just finish here. I spoke a lot about rational billiards. I just want to finish by saying that irrational billiards, so billiards with angles which are not multiple, irrational multiples of pi, are very much an open world. And even very basic questions like, is there a closed trajectory in any triangular billiards? Or is the billiard flow in a random, in all, in a, if you choose your angles at random, almost every, for almost every choice of the angle, is the dynamics in the irrational triangle ergodic? They are very much open. They don't, this is not a millennium price, but you can get $10,000 probably by the top if you can prove the ergodicity. Not a lot, okay, but, but uh, nothing. And uh, yeah, so in the, in the case of closed orbits, it's easy to find. It's uh, Euclidean geometry, you can try to find. Uh, the Fagnano trajectory, which is just the orthocenter, <laughs> the base of uh, heights, uh, this gives you a periodic trajectory of, of, of order 3. But if you take an obtuse triangle, if you ask if there is a closed trajectory, the answer is 99% yes, and there is a computer-based, a computer-assisted proof by Rich Schwartz. And the computer, you can Google MacBilliard and find a program that finds periodic orbits on triangles, but there is no mathematical proofs which people So irrational world is still very much open. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. It was really great lecture of an example of beautiful mixing of mathematical methodologies. <laughs> And uh, so please, uh, question, comments. Yes. Yeah. Say yes, we are in the um, <coughs> unfolding. You produce a linear flow on uh, uh, high gene surfaces. Yes. And then you say, well, there are these uh, yes. varieties. And then you said these are subtle points, but then yes. when you do the flow, but, that yeah. it does not look like an hyperbolic. No, it's not. It's actually, actually, I have a secret, secret slides. There are some extra slides that I put in. So I, I didn't ask you to ask this question, but I think I have, I have a thank you slide. And then I have another slide, which I need to show. So this is the formal definition of translation surface. It's, uh, Okay, let me skip this. So you want to have uh, local neighborhoods where the changes of coordinates in the definition of manifold are translations, plus conical singularity. So this is a picture of a conical singularity. It's what is called like a monkey saddle. So it's a neighborhood of a point which is glued out of, instead of 2 pi, out of 4 pi or 6 pi or 8 pi. So this is an example of, a, I think, 6 pi. So you take three half plates, three, three plates, you cut them, and you do it like z goes to z to third, like a threefold. Uh, it's a branched cover of degree three of the plane. So that's how a conical singularity looks like. It's, uh, the model is, if you like to think of Riemann surfaces, is z maps to z to the cube. So one, one, once you go around your point, you go three times around uh, in the plane. And uh, okay, next picture that I want to show you. This is uh, let me look. I want to show you that this is really a set. So if I look at linear trajectories in this polygon, this polygon gives me a surface by doing opposite parallel sides. If you look at the trajectories which enter the vertex, you see no, there are actually six 
trajectories which enter. Uh, so first of all, all vertices are identified by the gluings to a unique point on the surface. You should verify that. So this point is the same on the surface, the vertex. And there are six trajectories which enter the vertex. So if you look at linear trajectories, this vertex point has six, three incoming or three outgoing, if you want to think of them with orientation. So there are three incoming, if you orient your floor like this, there are three incoming and three outgoing <coughs> separatists. So it, it is a saddle point for the linear frame. I don't know how to, that's very interesting. So, but what, yeah, so this point is not flat, but you should think that uh, two, each two of these sectors is actually, they look like a half plane which is folded. So maybe I can just draw one picture. And uh, should I put it? Doesn't matter for I don't know if people in, I don't know if anybody was in the rap, no. <laughs> they can see the board, but doesn't matter. So what you should do is take three copies of the plane. To do a six pi singularity, you can take six pi singularity, six pi con angle. You can take three copies of the plane, slip them, and uh, cut them open by I don't know, gluing this with this, this with that, uh, sorry, this with this, this with that, and I don't know, this with this. And, it's, uh, and then if you look, for example, at vertical trajectories, you can try to convince yourself that you got this. So, uh, I want to say that each of these uh, two sectors is a, a plane which has been bended to be drawn in the plane. But you should really think of three planes branched and glued together. Okay, maybe it was not so clear, so I'm not so part of this. I think that's pain more later. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it wasn't. Yeah? Any other? Yes? So uh, uh, I understand that not everything is uh, understood already in the plane, but uh, are there any lines in the dimension 3 or in the case? Sorry? Is are there any lines in dimension 5 2? I am dimension 2. This is a question that I also get asked a lot. And the thing is that um, not much, because the problem is that we could start from billiards in a polyhedron and try to do this. The problem is that, apart from the cube rule, in the tile 3D, uh, the tile, the tile the, the space. Unfortunately, there's not such a rich theory like in the two-dimensional case, because essentially already if you take, uh, um, I don't know, a simplex, um, sorry, a regular tetrahedron, for example, the angles are incommensurate. So you don't get the finite volume three-dimensional manifold by unfolding. You already go to the infinite unfolding world. So as in the case of polygons, if you have this finite reflection group, so you can, you know, this rationality condition gives you finitely many copies unfolding and a surface which is compact. And then you have a rich normalization theory. If you go to this infinite world where you're unfolding, if you unfold that, you can still unfold an irrational triangle or an irrational polygon, just you have to take uh, count of the many copies. So you don't get a surface. And then you don't have a renormalization which is recurrent. So the, the modular space is not, doesn't have the recurrent normalization. So it's very much open as the irrational case is in dimension two. So it is true that it's quite a special word. So the normalization of the views of X for the question. That's the point. Yeah? Barbara, comments? Yeah. 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 Sure. Curiosity. Yes. You show extremely convex and smooth billion. And yes. then convex, not smooth, but not strictly convex. Uh, you want to talk about talking are you talking about Sinai? A billion versus should yeah. I think so? But how do I go back a lot? I yeah, have to go back. So strictly convex and smooth. Yes. And yes. Convex but non strictly and non smooth. And finally uh, non convex and non smooth in the word kings. Okay, so let me see. Non three convex inversus no smoothness. Okay, so like, I don't know how to uh, yeah, but in there. exhaustive way I can answer, but so let me go back maybe to the yeah, maybe here. So you're saying for example, here I have something which is a strictly convex and smooth, and here I have but non no, so, okay. Let me tell you. If you have for example a, a billiard which has a com are you talking about convex or are you talking about concave? I'm thinking more of concave on this side. 
not uh, convex. The last one is not convex, and you have two convex pieces. Yeah, so first of all, if you have concave pieces and flat pieces, the flat pieces don't matter so much because about the concave pieces kick in. So in some sense, you still have fast chaos that, uh, because the, you have this defocusing mechanism happening in the thanks to the strictly concave pieces. So I don't know. I want to say just this, concave pieces dominate uh, the fact of the flat one. It's just vague. You know, they have to prove something. About. And the other thing is singularities. Actually, so singularities like here, the singular singularities are a problem. So when people study these uh, uh, hyperbolic billiards, maybe I was a little bit fast by saying it's not true that everything is understood. There are things that people, uh, there is research, active research, a lot of active research on, on hyperbolic billiards and a lot on higher dimensional hyperbolic billiards, especially because indeed here the two dimensional case was very much, but there are also questions about People study transfer operators, decay of correlation, and lots of questions. And the presence of singularities is actually a key obstacle. So you can much more easily prove results for uh, when there are no singularities, but in figures usually there are singularities. So singularities are a reason for people who do mostly kind of analytic, analytic kind of methods in understanding <coughs> the properties like you can study decay of correlation by studying transfer operators and dealing with transfer operators when there are singularities requires quite sophisticated techniques and the Bolivarani in Rome is one of the people, key names and you know but yeah, the people who is that in France have developed tools for and understanding singularities in billiards is in higher dimensions for example is very much uh, and the open question in the search. Uh -oh. I don't know if this answer is enough. Yeah, so, but again, it's a little bit far from my work, so. Are there any other questions? No, I think thank you again for the evening. Thanks for the audience that I haven't seen, so it's... <laughs>